Hello, we're here today in Silicon Valley with Steve Jurvetson, partner at Draper Fisher Jurvetson. Uh, Steve has been involved in the conference for a number of years, and we had the privilege of having Steve as the keynote speaker the first year, six years ago. And we're going to ask Steve to uh, give us some information on what's going on in the Nordic region, the Baltic region, his experience with investments in the region and the like. So the first question, Steve, reflecting on your experience with Skype, and just as a footnote to this, one of the more amazing things that happened in my career here in Silicon Valley was being in the Ariaga Center in the summer of 2005, when the lights went dim about two in the afternoon, and there's Steve with the two founders of Skype on the launch of Skype video. The, the audience went wild. It was just the most fantastic experience because the quality was so superb, and recognizing that Skype had built on a foundation of free voice over IP, and there we are. So reflect on your experience with Skype and how that relates to uh, your investments in uh, the region. Sure. Uh, Skype is a, a wonderful story and dear to the heart of every Estonian, folks probably in the room who know it well. It, uh, it's almost like a, a virtual ambassador for the country of Estonia and, frankly, for entrepreneurship democratizing around the planet. The, you know, here a group of programmers, about four of them that created the core product the original voice product could, in fact, make a meaningful dent in the global telecoms market. That's it's pretty, uh, pretty seminal in that regard. We were uh, the largest early investor in the company. My partner, Tim Draper, and his father actually were angel investors early on. And then I negotiated the uh, first venture round uh, of investment, came to all the uh, board meetings in Tallinn, and my partner, Tim, was on the board. I was more of a cultural emissary myself. And, uh, and it was an amazing story. You had. Um, I think not only a great outcome for the people involved, but you have a lot of alumni, people who are former Skype executives and you know, engineers and such starting other companies. And it really, I think, proved in a way that, uh, that people could see very visibly that entrepreneurship is becoming global, right? The customers were global, the source of the company, Estonia, all around the world in news reports, people were like, well, what is this Estonian? Who are these people? And, and, and they hadn't really heard of it much. And so I think it's opened a lot of doors and uh, you know, we're, we're inc incredibly proud to have played some small role in helping them get their start. And, and has that led to uh, further interest in, and investments in Estonian companies and companies, other companies in the region from Draper Fisher? Yes, so DFJ has invested uh, in Skype, of course, which was our biggest win in the region so far, as well as uh, Eugene in Tartu, which is the second largest uh, city in Estonia. And then looking across the pond, the Baltic pond that is, um, to Finland, we've made quite a number of investments there, both out of this office and our team in London called DFJ Esprit, which has been working with the Finnish government actually to find opportunities there. In fact, there's two new investments already by both of us this year alone in Finland, um, specifically. Um, companies like Bitbar are doing cell phone applications testings or apps testing, and M-Files that does a variety of sophisticated meta uh, sort of data management for documents. So software companies, mobile mobile solutions in Finland has, has also been a major investment thing. Are there some particular things that, that come to mind that, that make the region uh, attractive from an investment standpoint? Are there characteristics of what's happening there that make this an important part of the life for the investment community? Sure. Um, I think first it's important at a very high level to realize that the need to have a Silicon Valley as the only place where entrepreneurship might exist, kind of like a Hollywood, this is where you go to get a movie done, or this is where you go to get, some done, get something done, is, is decreasing. Right? So there's proof points all around the world that you can launch global businesses in the consumer internet space very easily from just about anywhere. Maybe not so true for other kinds of physical and traditional industries. So the answer will vary quite a bit. But I think when you look at um, the relative attractiveness of any given region, it's never been a better time to start from a smaller economy uh, to try to serve global customers. The transaction costs via the internet are lower than ever before. But specifically to Estonia and the Nordics in general, there are a few things. You have you know, an early predisposition to use mobile and internet technologies. Partially with the lifting of the Iron Curtain, Estonia embraced new things. They didn't go with legacy systems. They had a fresh start in many, in many ways. Right. So the first e-government, the first uh, payments of parking um, and other kinds of systems. You, you find them as pioneers. In fact, early on, Nokia used Estonia as its sort of test market for new cell phone technologies back in the day. Expanding out, of course, to Finland, the, the early adoption of mobile technologies and, and Nokia's presence in that, of course, is, is very important looking farther afield, perhaps Ericsson as well uh, in Sweden. 
But uh, you have a population that was an early adopter of mobile solutions, and that is where the rest of the world is going. We have three billion people who are going to come online for the first time in the next seven years via these mobile smartphones, and they're not currently online. I mean, this is going to be a major growth opportunity, and I think underlying a lot of the opportunities in, in investments in IT are going to be mobile solutions, clearly. So the Nordics have um, um, a real lead on that in terms of penetration, early adoption, and, mo and apps that have been built on top of it. In Estonia, you have other sub things like, you know, frankly, having a socialized medicine environment is a plus when it comes to a move to a personalized medicine future. How are you going to do genetic screening in an easy way if you don't have guarantees that you're not going to be marginalized in terms of coverage for healthcare? So that's why we invested in eGene, um, uh, which has migrated a bit more to being like a contract research organization. But it's going to be much easier for me to imagine how a country like Estonia could migrate to a future of personalized medicine with frequent genetic screening than ever in the United States where we've got a heck of a lot of things to overcome in terms of payment systems and privacy regulations and HIPAA and all this stuff, and you just, you just you throw your head explodes. Um, there are other things going on just in terms of a culture of entrepreneurship. I mean, I think the region has, to its credit, um, an entrepreneurial spirit that you don't see everywhere in Europe and you certainly don't see everywhere in the world, and I hope it is infectious, meaning I hope it propagates outward where people can realize they can start businesses and should. And I think perhaps one of the reasons why Estonia has a leg up on some others is that it was almost as if the entire country was an immigration pool of its own people to their own homeland. When the Iron Curtain lifted, all of a sudden they're foisted into a modern economy without the legacies of, well, here's who's bought off the politicians for the past 50 years, like you have in the United States. Or here's the big industry that everyone needs to protect, like you have in the United States. You have a fresh start. You have people who got to make it one way or another and frankly have that fire in the belly to carve out an opportunity for themselves. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see such an entrepreneurial wave coming out of places like Estonia. How do you, how do you and your, your partners, um, what steps do you take to keep track of what's going on mm -hmm. in the region? What, what sources of information do you have? I mean, obviously you're, you're there time to time, your partners are there from time to time, but are there other things that you do that allow you to be connected to sort of the what's, what's next in the region? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's, it's difficult to do from a remote geography. So there's an old adage, the venture capital is a local business, meaning you uh, may invest in companies that are far around the planet, but if you're not able to be there on a regular basis, you won't be as helpful as an investor. You won't be on top of things quite as much, and that is still true. Um, obviously, with both my parents coming from Estonia and our investment in Skype, um, we have a special connection there that, that's worth disclosing, um, and that makes it a bit easier for me than, let's say, Latvia, well, which is just next door, um, uh, and maybe just as appropriate a place for me to be spending time on. So there are definitely these accidents of history that can be self-reinforcing mm -hmm. where we are interested in Estonia, that leads to more opportunities, which invests in more in Estonia, and, you know, and perhaps there's a divergence in at least our involvement with one country over another. It might be starting with simple happenstance. Um, over time, though, there are ways that we stay in touch. First is we try to keep a distributed partnership of related funds around the globe. So we have a group in Moscow, we have a group in London, not yet directly in Tallinn, but hopefully one day, um, who are affiliated with us in a network called the DFJ Network, and they uh, have an incentive to try to help each other because we know we'll be working together for decades, and so we share information, aggregate information on markets and such. To, in fact, the head of our London team is on his way to the office as we speak. You know, we'll be meeting again tomorrow, and it gives an opportunity for them locally to provide that local connection for, let's say, resume flow, and us globally to think about, well, is this a globally competitive business, right? So when we invested in Skype, we didn't see anything like it anywhere on the planet, not even in China or India where we have a major presence. And that ability to sample statistically across the planet allows us to be a little bit smarter, hopefully, um, or at least it's easier to be smarter about finding unique opportunities rather than trying to logically conclude, oh yes, this is a differentiated business for which there are high barriers to entry. Well, that's a theoretic exercise, but if you just look at every business plan, you can, you can know for sure. Um, we also, there's a totally different answer to your question. That was sort of things we do, distributed teams, some happenstance. There's also the flip side of the equation, which is sometimes it's easier, in fact, I think it's generally easier, for us to be a magnet so they can find us rather than us trying to find them. So if they're great entrepreneurs, there's just gonna be more of them. They won't have done press releases typically. They won't be visible to the world. We could network our way to them the way we did Skype. Actually, mm -hmm. Tim Draper purposefully networked his way to those two founders because he knew what was going on at Kazaa and wanted to talk to these guys. That's rare. 
that's actually a lot of overhead and a lot of work per company that you can mm -hmm. do that versus broadcast things like this event letting all of you know that we'd love to see what you're doing that we have a you know predisposition to invest in the region and it'd be much easier for me to reach out to hundreds of entrepreneurs through something like this than it would be to you know dial for deals or you know send emails randomly out to companies i'd find through web searches well not not probably the best mm -hmm. way so um to find a needle in the haystack, my strategy is pick a good haystack and then create a powerful magnet next to it. Let them know, blog about it, broadcast, somehow get the word out, the sectors that excite us, the ideas that excite us, and find entrepreneurs that share that vision and, the, and then they can find us better than we can find them. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about haystacks for a minute. Sure. Uh, as, as you and your partners look around uh, Europe, uh, where are the other places that you think in the next five years or so are going to be hot spots for innovation and entrepreneurship, obviously besides Estonia. Sure. Um, and you've already mentioned Finland. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the other places that you think uh, are going to be hot? For example, a num number of people think that Berlin is going to become probably the most exciting place in Europe mm -hmm. in the next five years for a number of reasons, one of which you just already cited, which is other than government, there's no legacy business in, mm -hmm. in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fun, it's cheap, it's like San Francisco in the sense of uh, of a life for young people, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to London or Paris or any of the other major cities in Europe. So what's, what's your view? What's the view that, that you guys take on where, if you had to restrict yourself to, say, five or six different locations in Europe, where would you be concentrating? It's a really difficult question because we have a historical answer that makes sense retrospectively which would be the UK first, Israel second, if you include Israel in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's kind of an arbitrary right. dividing line sure. if you really think about it. Um, and then Finland slash Germany, you know, the whole country, uh, you know, tied perhaps for, you know, with who's in third. I think overlaid on that, though, is an opportunistic, you know, sort of crapshoot because the answer looking forward could pivot quite dramatically on whether or not serendipity shines upon Berlin and they have a local heroic you know, sort of outcome that then feeds others. I think Germany in general, um, sort of Eastern versus Western, depending on how you look at Berlin, you know, is it a melange, um, uh, may have a cultural difference, but there's been a generic, how we say, entrepreneurial, how sh uh, almost uphill battle uh, culturally on mm -hmm. willingness to take risk, you know, emb embodied in things like bankruptcy law, which has made Germany its own special case of, you know, ripe with, of sort of technology and in smart people, yet this cultural norm that's hard to overcome. France has its own set of, you know, self-defeating policies and, uh, uh, and sort of mantras that, you know, you know, God bless them, I love, I love it for certain things, but it's not necessarily the best place to try to hire anybody uh, with, a, with, a, with an employment contract, <laughs> uh, especially if you ever need to downsize that business, as we've learned. So, um, you know, French and Germany are special. They've been talked about a lot, a lot. You know, if I look at a snapshot today, Let's say for our London team, which would have a sample selection bias because they're based in London, you know, almost half of the business plans come to the UK for that group. Um, and of course, you'd expect that because that's where they're based. But I'm not so sure that if you step back and look at, you know, the region's overall uh, makeup today, you probably would see a UK number one, Israel number two, mm, although Germany's going to be way up there as well. Uh, now, does do things change? Does a city like Berlin rise up for the reasons you mentioned? I think it could, but I'll say I, I don't have any personal knowledge to say, you know, here, here's something useful I could say about that. You know, it might or it might not. I really don't know. All I know is that things in Europe haven't changed nearly as rapidly, mainland Europe, that is, uh, nearly as rapidly as anyone might want or hope. Um, you know, unfortunately, if you look back in time, there's been a lot of false hopes of, right. oh, yes, maybe things are changing. Maybe there'll be an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial wave and I'm still waiting for it. Well, that's, it's a percolation. Yeah, right? It's you, just like steady. You, you, steady you, as she goes. Right? You, you pick, picked up on another uh, aspect of this, which is uh, entrepreneurs looking out uh, from where they are and finding their way to Silicon Valley. Historically, Silicon Valley has uh, been the place where most the most capital is, you know, from within 100 yards of your office, there's billions mm -hmm. of dollars of capital looking for good deals. Silicon Valley, you know, is 35 to 40 percent of all the investment in the United States comes from here, within 50 miles of here. Uh, if you look, if you then look at the world as a whole, Silicon Valley clearly is at the top of the of the pyramid in terms of where investment capital is and where deals get done. Do you think that's going to continue to be the case for the foreseeable future? Um, 
Yes and no. Yes, I think it will continue to be the single largest node, but it's already the case that its relative share is declining, meaning other areas are rising up. If you look back just 20 years ago, it's, it's kind of astounding how different it was from today in that the vast majority of U.S. venture capitalists, ourselves included, never looked at a business plan from outside the region, like, like throughout the entire year, nor did any of the companies we invest in serve global customers from the get-go. It was only after they dominated the U.S. market. So it was U.S. companies going after U.S. markets and then Europe and Japan, of all things, were the afterthought, like around the time of IPO, through a partnership, you might start selling your software or your semiconductors in these new markets, and they would be, you know, ROW, rest of the world, right? Fast forward to today. I mean, almost every business we invest in, whether it's here or elsewhere, tries to serve a global market, or at least needs to have an explanation of what the global opportunity is day one, right? It's not like, oh, well, all that matters is the U.S., right? So, so a lot has already changed in that regard that we might almost take for granted because year by year, you don't see the changes profoundly, mm -hmm. but, but it has changed a lot already. Um, there are reasons, I think, why Silicon Valley holds on for longer than one might theorize. Right? If you're thinking back you know, 30 years, you might wonder, well, really, would it last that long? Um, there are some analogies to Hollywood still, where um, in what we do as venture capitalists, there is still a bit of a difficulty in spotting winners. Uh, co contrast, let's say, Hollywood to the, the music industry, which has gone through profound change and has been revolutionized. You might ask yourself, why hasn't... The Hollywood studio model gone through as profound change. What's different about movies and music? And in, in a way, there is a difference. There's a lot of money to make a movie. Music's very cheap to create. And it's after it's been created that you might sign a contract and say, well, you know, do I need representation? Do I need distribution? And as many musicians realize, they don't, right, in this modern area. That's going through profound change. I might say venture capital feels a bit more like the Hollywood model in that there are small films, there are indie films, there's people peeling off all parts of the stack. Bollywood is entering. It's definitely changing. But Hollywood's hanging on a lot longer than anyone in the music industry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that's part of the analogy. It will change. It will globalize. It's just moving a little bit more slowly. And there's still a reason, really, the human talent concentration, why software-related businesses are a little easier to start around here. And you'll find even new ones like Tesla Motors and SpaceX, both of which right. I'm involved with, which, of all places, have built their manufacturing operations in California. Right? Right. Right. So the, the, there's something about the momentum of having software talent here that makes all kinds of interesting businesses continue to locate here. Well, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's take that one step further. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've already touched on it. There are a number of interesting software, IT, low capital intensive businesses mm -hmm. that are founded in uh, Northern Europe, in Estonia, um, Finland, etc. It would seem that for those companies in thinking about their global expansion that Recently, the next step has been not Germany, not the UK, but Silicon Valley. Hmm. Uh, and I wondered if that's your perception, and uh, is it of necessity that, that this is the next step? Because if you think about uh, the consumer market, mm -hmm. you know, in theory we've got you know, 320 million consumers, all speaking a common language except for Louisiana. Um, hmm. <laughs> Uh, where <laughs> as someone from Texas, I don't know what you mean. There you go. Okay, uh, where where the, the uh, where as contrasted with Europe, where there's a larger population, but they have you know 35 different languages, and right. however many, it would seem that the easiest next step is to get on the plane at uh, mm -hmm. at uh, the Tallinn Airport or in Helsinki and get off in SFO and mm -hmm. take a cab down here and set up business, and it's mm -hmm. really easy to do. And right. I wondered if you think that 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 is in fact uh, a, a rational uh, decision making, or whether there's some other things that entrepreneurs need to, ha excuse me, have in mm -hmm. mind when they think about heading to the airport. What are the things that they need to to think about before mm -hmm. they pay for their ticket? Should they go to mm -hmm. London? Should they go to the Valley? Should they go to New York? Mm -hmm. Any number of places they can go. Should they go to China? Should they go to India? Right. And, and and I suppose the answer is going to depend on the business they're in. But are there any generalizations that you can make? Remembering that the audience that we're talking to are young entrepreneurs who've got big ideas and they're going to develop their ideas in a relatively small market uh, where if they're going to expand on a global basis, they really have to think at the time of the founding of the company, what's the next step? What's the, where do we jump to? Right. And so this is a, this is a sort of an open-ended question. What should they be thinking about in thinking about that decision from the beginning? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think you alluded to the key uh, sort of analytical framework for the answer, which is 
how does the business differ and what, and what framework might one use? So you think of a spectrum on one end, um, specifically a spectrum on what is your cost of sales and your cost of manufacturing. And on one end, you might could have consumer internet products that have no cost of manufacturing, and if structured correctly with a viral marketing strategy the way Skype and Hotmail and others did, perhaps no cost of sales, no direct sales team. Then you're actually never getting on the plane to start because you don't really need a physical presence anywhere, right? right? right. So, but it's important highlighting that there is one extreme that says, serve the US market, you maybe have a few folks later after you've actually won the market. Um, on one extreme that side of the equation. Um, th I'm thinking back to Hotmail being the largest email provider in Sweden for a period of time where they never even went and never even produced a Swedish version of the product. Um, the other end of the spectrum though, because there are many types of businesses, you have manufacturing operations, you're building something, and you have a direct sales force. The answer will be very different there. And, and I think the reason that spectrum, and there's everything in between, um, for that, you might, depending on shipping costs, right, want to go local because perhaps you can inherently spread out because of, of shipping costs. If getting, like, like even something like natural gas, you can't ship that around the world so easily. So those tend to be a localized market. You know, fracked natural gas very cheap in the United States, cheaper than the Middle East, uh, whereas oil is a global commodity. So that the difference on shipping costs plays into it a lot. But if you don't have shipping costs, or if through partnering, let's say, with a contract manufacturer, um, let's say for certain types of semiconductors or what have you, you could just as easily build them or ship them and the value per unit weight is high, you, would, you might want to go to the U.S. because of a unified market language and, and market size and obviously China as well, especially if your product doesn't have translation issues. If it's not a communications product as much as, let's say, again, a semiconductor, you may find, oh, maybe I want to go to China. So. Um, that's how I think about it. Like if you're in a smaller European country, would you go to a larger European market first or you might jump to the US. The um, interesting thing, I guess, for me on, on, on thinking about that prioritization is uh, you could put a similar filter on how regionally sheltered is your business. So if you're on this end where there's no cost of sales and uh, no manufacturing cost, you are a global business even if you don't act like one. And your competitors could come from anywhere. And oh, by the way, in the next seven years, there'll be three billion people coming online for the first time. They're not just potential consumers of your product, that's the upside. They're also all potentially going to online education systems and perhaps are just as entrepreneurial and even hungrier, right, coming out of who knows what region of the developing world. Three billion new competitors potentially are entering the entrepreneurial pool for pure IT products and services. So as the world increasingly looks like this, where almost every product and industry becomes an IT industry, those become globally accessible rapidly growing, but so too globally competitive. There's no regional shelter. And so what we normally think of as an albatross to manufacturing and direct sales becomes a bit of a shelter mm -hmm. in that you could be the regional expert in something. Um, your job might even be more secure in some of these kinds of industries. Um, the analogy I, I give is if you're, um, if you're a really uh, mediocre cook or barber, you might find lifetime employment in a small town. <laughs> Whereas if you're a mediocre Java programmer, you know, you're kind of screwed, right? There isn't a, you know, a regionally sheltered market for the, you know, at least a freelancer, right? If you're yeah. a freelance yeah. Java programmer, you know, yeah. it's obviously a global market. And, and we, it, more of the world's going that way. All jobs used to be over here. All jobs used to be regionally sheltered. They're now increasingly global right. and globally competitive. Let's uh, switch a little bit to the future for the financing aspects of, sure. of entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, you're your partner's grandfather mm -hmm. uh, was one of the founders of uh, the venture business on the West Coast. So we, the very first one? The very yeah. first one. Yeah. And so your firm as a sort of a legacy of that foundation uh, activity, you know, three generations of, of drapers uh, in, investing in successful companies, a wide spectrum of successful companies. Do you expect that the business is going to go on for another three generations beyond this in the same sort of fashion that it's, that it's been built up today? Or what, what changes would you expect over the next years? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting too, it's when I think back over that period of time. Um, if, if you phrase the question, will the next three generations, I mean, this is a long time, right? I mean, that's like equivalent to the entire history of West Coast Venture Capital, yes, right? right? If you said, is it going to be the same as it is right now? I would say hopefully not, because right. that actually implied that the rate of change is slowed. Right. What may seem glacial is a uh, change that we've seen today. Right? So per my earlier comment, we've actually, since the beginning of venture capital on the West Coast, seen a lot of change. The average fund back then was maybe $8 million in size. They were doing semiconductor deals and things that were defense related. There was a smattering of life sciences. Software was kind of wild and woolly. 
a very um, local, uh, you know, closely knit, slow moving in terms of industry, uh, sort of adaptation to industry change and things like there were folks whose whole careers were based on semiconductor VC or an entire career on sort of enterprise software investing only, right? And today we're a lot more fluid. So there's, you know, I will, I'll be the first to say the venture industry feels lethargic uh, and, and glacial compared to entrepreneurs that we invest in. Mm -hmm. And I'll also uh, fully admit that we rarely do much introspection and apply our own rules of thumb to ourselves. We rarely uh, innovate much, but that's also true for almost any incumbent. You'll, the dramatic change will probably come from the outside and then it will percolate through and, and we may or may not change with it. Uh, we hope to, we're trying as the industry to, to be ahead of that curve, but, but I'll admit with a degree of hopefully objectivity that our industry in general feels more sheep-like and steady as she goes than dynamic and changing and we're blowing everything up and you know, re reinventing ourselves, right? Uh, but if you look back over three generations of Drapers, you know, again, small investments, limited number of industries, not particularly tech-centric in terms of the skill set of the investors in many cases, a very interesting different kind of era to a very diverse set of folks with different cognitive skills. You have everyone, all kinds of different backgrounds in the venture industry today. You have global investments, not just Silicon Valley. You have you know, a very different makeup today than even, frankly, even 15 years ago. So I think we'll see just as much change at a minimum going forward, three more generations, but I think you'll see more. I think you'll see experiments in uh, data-driven, sort of big data, machine learning based programmatic investment that Google Ventures is experimenting with, so it's correlation mm -hmm. ventures and a few others where the human relation part of the equation is pulled out, kind of like that movie Moneyball with right. Billy Bean. It's like, you guys got your rules of thumb, that's all great, how about we like analyze the data? Because we finally have data and we can analyze it, right? We'll see, that may very well work and I think that will exist somewhere in this ecosystem. Will it take over where other traditional investments gone? I'm not so sure, again, back to Hollywood. If it was so easy, could you formulaically score movie scripts before they're made to know, hey, that's the one that should get the $100 million budget? versus, hey, that's James Cameron, let's give him $100 million. I don't know what he's doing, let's give him $100 million. You know, that, that kind of dichotomy is, is, is a bit interesting in the venture business, some would argue. And, and, it, would, and it will vary by sec sector. So clearly consumer internet businesses that need very little money to get to a proof point, that's more like the music model. That's more like, go out and produce your first hit single. Just come talk to me when you have a hit single, right? Could be the, the, the point of view. In the movie industry, that's a little more difficult. So I think you'll see the most profound change and it's already underway with Kickstarter campaigns, angel financing, super angels, you name it, around consumer internet, anything that takes a few hundred thousand dollars to get to a proof point of a prototype or a release product. And then on the other end of some spectrum, hard tech, you know, big science, patented inventions, quantum computing, rockets, cars, what have you. SpaceX, pool, yeah, yeah, SpaceX. Like, these things, these need a big pool of capital. I mean, some of these are even too bold for the average venture firm traditionally, and it took someone like Elon Musk to fund them mm -hmm. for their angel rounds. Um, and so, um, I think you're going to see a lot of change. I don't think it necessarily blows up the industry and that hopefully the best firms will continue to call themselves venture capital firms so that entrepreneurs know this is where you go to get funding um, from an organization that stands for something than more than just money. But alongside that, there will be groups that just provide money. And there should be a fluid market, ideally for easy money. Like when I say easy, small amount, uh, presumably. Um, I'm not sure how big it could get and still be easy. Um, that's available to a wide array of other companies that otherwise might not get funding at all. Some of the data that's produced by uh, Pricewaterhouse, the Money Tree mm -hmm. reports and similar reports, suggest that that the organized venture capital community, the Sand Hill Road crowd, if I can use that phrase, mm -hmm. has uh, pulled back to a certain extent from financing very early deals. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are a number of, of funds that, that look only at really early deals. But by and large, the, the, the industry, the organized industry, uh, Sand Hill Road crowd, has tended to pull back over time if you look at the percentages of, of deals that are funded by you and your big competitors. It's s gone down over time. And, and on the other hand, we see the rise of the so-called super angels who are supplying not just 100,000, but larger sums of money to companies that in five years ago would be somebody that would be knocking at your door. Uh, do you see, do you have a sense for, uh, is, is this a result of the fact that these firms that were, are in, being invested in by the super angels are firms that aren't as capital intensive as the SpaceX's and the Tesla's mm -hmm. or is there some other factor at work here in terms mm -hmm. of the, 
relatively relative stepping back from really early stage investments by organized capital. Yeah, no, it's, I think you're, you're right, but there, and there could be a second factor as well. So I think the first one that looms large in my mind is that the category of consumer internet, and oh, by the way, some of enterprise software starts to look like consumer internet. So this, this is a right. category that's expanding its scope. Um, lends itself most easily to angel investing, and therefore, it's more of a, a wildly competitive landscape. The, there's a very different picture in the, in the investments that I'm looking at in synthetic biology, in the hard tech areas, where it, you know, there are no angels to be found. I mean, I'm not running, and frankly, very few venture capitalists. So there's a whole other angle that says, why aren't venture capitalists doing hard tech as much, meaning the rockets, right. the cars, the robots, the AI, the quantum computing, the synthetic biology. These are really exciting areas, and I'm frankly delighted that they're a little bit underrepresented by all forms of investment. Um, they do need more institutional kind of approach, et cetera. So it's important to separate those two, because I mean, frankly, these other ones are gonna be an increasingly large part of the economy. I think everything becomes an information business, and those who are just thinking about consumer internet might miss all this other opportunity that's out there. So that's, that's where I'm investing, and that's part, part of my answer. So, so that's one part of it. But there's a second one, which is, for any given venture firm, if you look at it from that point of view, are they doing more or less venture investing? And then if you just look, just look at venture capital firms, you know, where are they shifting? And I think there, there's a more subtly more subtle and difficult to tease out pattern of a long wave cycle, about seven years in its iteration of how private equity booms and busts, venture capital booms and busts, and when it's busting, the people that get squeezed out of the venture business tend to be the new entrants who are not yet proven because they can't raise their next fund. Mm -hmm. Or if they're early stage, they usually have to wait the longest to get their returns, so they're most vulnerable if folks are being very, um, how should we put it, um, picky on who they invested. And when times are good and money's flushing into it, then early stage funds are more easily to form, new entrants are more easily funded, in the venture business that is, and everyone's got more money to do things that might be longer term. So that's maybe one of the sort of most breathing in and out cycles. Yeah. Why does it do that? Why would it oscillate as opposed to just be monotonically increasing or what have you? I think it has to do with the long feedback loop between decisions we make and when that feedback of were they good or not arrives for our investors. So if you're a person giving money to venture yeah. funds, you're gonna see returns go up, you start allocating more capital, that floods the market with capital, it starts to depress returns, and you go through these long wave cycles, much like in the 80s with uh, memory chip, uh, right. from the 80s to the present day, a memory chip DRAM fab capacity planning. If you make a commitment of capital, but then over years you recoup and need to you know, commit, you know, finish a commitment that may be a 10 year commitment that you, you right. baked in now, you'll see the same oscillation. I think you'll see it in natural gas prices for fracked natural gas in the United States as well, which is same long wave cycles that, that pivot on what is the time frame between capital commitment, LPs make 10 year commitments when they, when they do this, mm -hmm. and when do you know if that was a good or bad decision? So I think that's an overlay, and right now we're in one of those, I believe, things where investments that were made in the not too recent past right. are gonna be really awesome in terms of returns, but you wouldn't see it in the current numbers. And, yeah. Because we flushed out the, the investments that were made in 2000, 2001, 2002, they're sure. either hit it over the wall or they're dead. Yeah, they've they, come to some conclusion. They, they've come to a conclusion <laughs> somehow. Yeah. A um, couple of last questions. Mm -hmm. as, as you look out into the future, five, the next five years, what are the areas of the economy that you think are going to be the most, the, the uh, greatest interest to uh, entrepreneurs, innovation, lend themselves to disruptive technologies, uh, and are going to be of interest to, to you and your partners here and in terms of, of we're interested in financing companies that are going to be doing this and this is a sort of a long horizon look mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to next week or next year absolutely uh, is, is is space x just the beginning of something mm -hmm. is the ocean i know you've you've talked you've mm -hmm. talked about the ocean uh, when we we're here six years mm -hmm. ago sure. um, what are the things sure. that excite you about the future uh, that give you enthusiasm that we're we have just beginning to see the changes that can be made by innovation and entrepreneurship with, with capital applied to the right places. Yeah, I, and, and that summarizes well. I've never been more excited, and I believe I'll be able to say that every year because it just keeps getting better, and, and I think there are good reasons why it does. So two major brushes for analytically how I think about it. So instead of just a random hodgepodge of data points, the one is what is the real effect of ubiquitous mobility to the planet? So I mentioned three billion people coming online. Think through what that means. They're all going to want online education, so the MOOCs. They're all going to be bottom of the pyramid folks to start with. So 
digital currencies, ways of doing commerce, all the Bitcoin related stuff or something like it, a way for the rural farmer somewhere out there to get business done. I think there will inevitably be an increased outsourcing of programming, of other simple tasks, could be um, crowdsourced tasks for you know press releases or graphic arts, legal services, you name it. It's gonna start with things that could be farmed out. It's gonna then have layers of management on top of it. There's gonna be an information economy, I think, that is brokered over these mobile devices and synthesized across them. That's gonna be huge. So one day there'll be a bigger market for like the eBay for information than there would be for the eBay of physical goods because there'll just be more information product that could be bought or sold. That's one cluster, one analytical thing that says pay attention to that. Another one, the one I use more often, because um, that mobile thing is well covered by a lot of venture capitalists. And in fact, most of my partners here at DFJ, that's what they would think about. The thing I think about is Moore's Law, the compounding capacity to compute. Over 110 years, if you look at it the right way, what if that goes on for the next 20? What does that mean? And the key takeaway there is it doesn't just revolutionize computing or software. We already know datacom, then telecom, then, oh, by the way, bioinformatics in the current biotech wave. What's next, right? So right now, I think we're in the middle of industrial biotech 2.0, where we can re-engineer algae and bacteria and life forms to make what? Uh, initially, specialty chemicals. Then, uh, that's the highest profit margin. Uh, that's easy to make. Then uh, nutraceuticals. May imagine things like omega-3 rich oils and proteins, and eventually synthetic meat. That's more like 20 years out, but precursors will be sooner. Um, and, and, and maybe one day fuels that you burn, but that's just such an uncreative thing to do with something. You know, if, of all the things you could do economically with the thing you make, burning it, you know, probably the cheapest and worst business model. Um, but that whole field, and then eventually human health, I don't even mention that, right? That, that is all IT driven. What's next? Agriculture. So I mentioned nutraceuticals, but actually re-engineering plants. We have a company in Israel that doubles up the DNA in every plant cell and it's not considered a GMO in Europe. So they do open field trials and it's beautiful. So the plant expresses the archetype of its species. Every recessed gene is more recessed. It's like having four parents instead of one. Pretty amazing. Stuff like that would be commonplace. So hopefully it'll save the planet because we need to grow more food in the next 40 years than we've grown since the beginning of the invention of agriculture. So no matter what Europe tries to do about GMOs, it will fail because if we don't do GMOs somewhere else on the planet, everyone will die. So we will do GMOs, trust me on that. Um, everyone in Europe, just give it up. And if not, then buy Kaima's product and pretend it's not a GMO. Um, uh, and it's not, not by regulation. <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. So, uh, so let me not get too distracted by that. Then there'll be others. I think um, we made our first robotics investment recently. Now, there have been robots for a long time, but it had, didn't feel like the Apple II moment the way it does now, mm -hmm. where because of the decreasing ch cost of cell phones, the technology used in a cell phone, motion sensors, processors, low power devices, you can now make things like robots and drones and satellites more cheaply than ever before. Um, in a sense, taking that brain in the box and giving it arms and limbs or putting it in a satellite, all of a sudden it's a super good device and in, 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 in very cheap. So um, we are seeing the mobile, the, sort of the, the peace dividend of the cell phone wars, if you will, percolating into robotics, satellites, and who knows what else. But I think the robotics avenue is gonna lead to artificial intelligence in about three years from now that we'll probably make our first investment there. Um, and that whole avenue is like an example of the next one. Um, I, I alluded to agriculture, but we're investing in seed companies, like four or five different ones. Kaima is just one of them. Most of the others are just straight out GMOs, just at the core of it, uh, re-engineering the plant to do something useful, like make a more nutritious product or maybe make something that uh, is a chemical that you want to use. Um, and I think it just keeps going. But the framework is A, there will be always a new industry. It'll be an industry typically that has been sheltered from competition for decades. Think about rockets and cars, right? There hasn't been a US startup that succeeded in like, since well, cars since Henry Ford, in rockets like not since the Cold War. Um, and even those were kind of dubious beginnings in the military industrial complex. These are industries that haven't faced a real competitor in ages, nor have the chemical companies for that matter, um, or the oil and gas exploration companies. You know, They're all open to competition now, um, and the oil and gas and chemicals are maybe the most robustly resilient against that. Um, but this is all gonna change. And so what, you know, there isn't like an industry today that, that's the end, of the end of this theme. This theme percolates through every industry and converts it into information technology over time, where unfortunately the labor content goes way down, the information content goes way up, and every business starts to look like an information business. And I think the good part is these trillion dollar industries can be made much more efficient. And in this future, everybody will live a better life and have better access to solutions like they've never had before, but there'll also be a lot less employment. But that's, it's a whole other economic side right. discussion that wasn't part of your question. Right. You know? we got, we got, we're going to wrap this up sure. here. Um, Steve, one final question. Knowing that here in the audience we've got 
a, you know, a group of, of young entrepreneurs who are you know, looking forward to living out their dreams and capturing markets and doing all the things that you've talked about you know, with the help of many people like you and, and others around the world. What, do you have any last words of encouragement for the process? Should, should people recognize that, that this is the way of the world and that uh, we have to live with the risk, the risk that's associated with this whole process, which means that there's going to be some fall off that's not particularly happy. But uh, as opposed to, you know, getting a PhD and uh, working for the government. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on which government. Yeah, there may be well, one or no, two I, out there. I was thinking about the demonstrations in France when they tried to change the labor laws. And here in the United States, we saw that 70% uh, of the young people you know, when asked what kind of a job they wanted if they, after they got out of the university, said, well, we'd like to work for the government. Oof. And, um, you know. Well, not, one day maybe that'll be like, it'll be like a nation that is a, um, no, I should joke about this, yeah. a sort of a cultural artifact itself. Right. And just it's, all, it's entire purpose is to preserve but, itself. You know, sort of the last yeah. words to the entrepreneurs. Yeah. So the the entrepreneurs, audience. we're all entrepreneurs, right? Despite those who might want to be Amish and preserve, for good reasons, almost like a museum of, of uh, for, you know, for, for anthropological study. Other than that, if you want to be engaged with progress in any concept of the word progress, you're going to be involved with technology. You're going to be involved with change. You're going to be an entrepreneur, and we are all going to be entrepreneurs. Um, the, the reason I say that with such confidence is the pace of technological change is accelerating and will in perpetuity. The disruption of industries starts with a few that we've seen well. It percolates to all. So the good news is if you are a new entrant, either as a, a new person into the job market or someone who's willing to learn and be adaptive throughout their life so they're learning a new business as they go along, this is a good time. If you're someone who wants to cling to the past, this is not such a good time. If you're a young economy like Estonia, no better time to compete with large global economies. It's, it's the same framework as small companies and big companies. If there wasn't disruption and change, the big get bigger, the small get crushed. End of story. It's only because of economic disruption that you're going to have a changing of the playing field. If the rules of the game change, new entrants tend to win, and they always do. Luckily, the rules are changing more and more frequently. So it has never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Um, it's never been a better time to try to do it in, from a small economy, and that story is just going to get better and better and better. The flip side is there's no reason to hold on to your laurels. Once you've made it big, once you're the big Skype or you're the big whatever, Microsoft, oh my gosh, no one even thinks about Microsoft anymore, your lifetime will be lower than ever before. You're not going to build a General Electric that lasts 100 years. The rate of death of companies of countries, of flags that fly with sovereignty is going to be shorter and shorter. So at the individual level, you have to have a philosophy of lifelong learning. You're not going to have one career. You're not going to do one thing. You're going to have to be learning something new, certainly every decade, if now it feels like maybe every five years. You're going to be something to, hey, I'm investing 100% in companies and in industry sectors that I did not know existed 10 years ago. I would never have guessed that I'd be looking at agricultural deals or space deals. I would have given that a 0.1% possibility. And that is just a proxy for everyone's career in a sense that it's going to be fluid. You're going to move on to new things. And luckily, you know, with online learning, it's never been easier to proactively enrich your life throughout. And you'll, you'll live a healthier life to boot, which is nice. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.